Greetings. What if I told you that half of all economic progress that has ever occurred, half of all human prosperity gains that have ever occurred since the beginning of humanity have happened after January 1st of 2000, or in other words, have happened in the last 21 and a half years? At first glance, you may not believe that. You may think that is ridiculous because how could the midpoint, the halfway point of all economic progress, be that recent? But those of you who are familiar with this channel know better than that because you are familiar with the accelerating and exponential rate of progress both across technology as well as therefore across economics. And in this video, we're going to look at the data that backs that up. So here we are in chapter two of my Atom publication. And if you want to read this, the link is in the description box below. And if you want to hear it in the form of an audio book, that link is in this card right up here. So we scroll down. And I have two metrics over here that are actuals. This is what has already occurred. And in fact, since the time of this publication update, which was about a year ago, things have advanced further still. But I click on this chart. And as you can see over here, we have GDP in current US dollars. We do not edit out inflation for reasons I will explain. And then we have the S&P 500. So GDP, which only starts in 1960, the charts from Google charts don't go further back than that. You can see a distinct exponential curve over here. Now here's the thing, GDP is actually a very, very suboptimal metric of measuring economic progress because it does not account for things like software and knowledge-based products nearly as well as it should. In the old days, GDP was based on spending on large capital equipment, such as machinery, houses, and construction, and things like that, whereas software-type products and the fact that more and more products are being reduced into software, music, video, et cetera, is being reduced into software, GDP becomes very suboptimal. The problem with GDP, if I were to summarize in one sentence, is that GDP rewards doing more with more, much more than it rewards doing the same with less. Whereas technology is usually about the latter, doing the same with less and eventually doing more of that after you've done a lot of the same with less. But GDP is nonetheless exponential and the stock market as measured by the S&P 500, which represents about 97% of the US stock market in market capitalization, is an even smoother exponential and a steeper growth rate. And the S&P 500 is of course a nominal metric and the dividends are not even captured in this chart. So the actual returns are even greater than this because about 1.7% a year or maybe 17% of all annual S&P 500 returns are in fact in the form of dividends. And you see a very distinct exponential curve over here. Even though it meandered and was choppy for about a decade from 1998 until 2009 or so, you see that the trend line is a very smooth exponential curve. And no matter what happens, recessions, market crashes, all sorts of other problems, it is a very smooth exponential curve. And that was there before the age of money printing from the Federal Reserve, quantitative easing, and after. Quantitative easing started in 2009 and is going strong today and will be permanent and exponential, as I explain elsewhere in this channel. And that is also a good thing because all economic growth is exponential. Technology is exponential. Technology engineers deflation, which requires money printing to offset, and therefore economic growth becomes exponential. So you see from the two most popular metrics, GDP and the stock market, that progress is exponential. Now, if you took GDP, the halfway point was before January 1st, 2000, so maybe in the mid-1990s, and we have to take world GDP, of course, always. Never take just the United States or any other one country. You take world GDP, of course. So under GDP, the halfway point might have been in the mid to late 1990s, a little bit before 2000, but that's fine. But with the stock market, the midpoint was much more recent. The current S&P 500 is as high as 4,400. So the midpoint from that 2,200 was in 2015 or 16. So half of all economic progress as measured by the stock market happened much, much more recently than January 1st, 2000. The midpoint was far sooner than that. Now there will be stock market corrections, I believe, the current stock market is ahead of trend line to some extent. But even if you take a number of snapshots, you will see that the gradient is very steep. So if you combine these two metrics, GDP as well as the stock market, it's very, very easy and actually conservative to say that half of all human economic progress has occurred after January 1st of 2000. And remember, always take world GDP. 
the SP 500 is a much more global metric, even though it's a U.S. stock market, because a fair percentage of U.S. corporations get their profits from overseas. So it's much more globally diversified than it may appear, even though it's originated from the U.S. Now, here's the thing about the exponential rate of economic growth. There is no other subject that affects more things and more people so completely, but yet it has so little written about it. If you do a Google search about something as simple as exponential economic progress, in the last 15 years, you will find that only about three people have written anything substantial about that subject, and one of those three people is me. Therefore, when I do a Google search for something like that, I see most of my own materials come up. And that is sad because there should be hundreds of people researching this topic, maybe even thousands, and I would like to see more nuances and intricacies of research around that. But because the economics profession is so outdated in its thinking, and frankly, very ignorant about certain first principles of economics, there are very few credentialed economics who have even once mentioned the concept of accelerating exponential economic growth as proven by centuries of data. The only one that I know of is Brad DeLong, who is an economics professor at the University of California, Berkeley. And he wrote one or two articles around the turn of the century, around 2000 or 2001, about this subject and very little after that. So that is the sum total of output of virtually all the PhD economists that exist in the Western world. It's really quite pathetic because the single biggest feature of their own field is something they are oblivious of. We know that PhD economists are eggheads and there's no major field where the credentialed establishment knows less about the changes in their own field or the first principles of their own field than macroeconomics, the PhDs in macroeconomics. And I will talk about that more in other videos, but it is really a travesty because a lot of human prosperity is being blocked for that reason. And your prosperity is being held back by the fact that ultra theoretical eggheads are the ones guiding economics policy. I mean, if you needed a surgery, you would not go to someone who had only read books about surgery and had no practical experience. But we entrust economics policy with people who are the equivalent of that. They're super theoretical and they always make predictions that are wrong and have no sense of irony that if their predictions are wrong, somehow their credibility should go down because they only interact with people just like them. More on that in other videos. But as we go back to the main article, I want to show you another chart, which is this one. This chart is a little bit difficult to understand at first glance, so let me explain it verbally. The vertical axis is world per capita GDP, current dollars, of course, and in a logarithmic scale. So as you can see, the scale is logarithmic. The horizontal axis goes in the reverse direction years ago from 2050. So zero years ago from 2050 would be the year 2050. 50 years ago would be the year 2000. 100 years ago would be the year 1950. 200 years ago would be the year 1850. So on and so forth. So what we see here from data that we have gathered across a number of indicators going back to all of the civilizations at the time is that economic growth was virtually flat until the year 1500 because technological progress is very little on a per year basis. 0.01% progress per year. Very little actual economic progress was visible during the lifetime of the typical person then and lifetimes were shorter than two as well. And then after 1500, there was slight increase, still very imperceptible to most people. Very little real change was seen over the course of a person's lifetime in terms of technology or prosperity. And then it started to increase and then started to get steeper and steeper by the 18th century, 19th century, and the 20th century. Now, the years that I have labeled this chart with are actual years to help make it easier to see. 1950 was 100 years before 2050, 2000 was 50 years before, and so forth. So we keep on continuing. And the green portion of the chart represents actuals. This is what has already occurred. This is not something that will occur. It has already occurred. It is completely baked into the cake. And now the blue portion is merely the projection of this trend line that was already established for many centuries, projected forward to 2050. 2050 is only 29 years in the future from now, but it shows how much prosperity will occur because remember, this vertical axis is also logarithmic. Now, it's notable how smooth this line is, whether a Great Depression, which occurred around here, a World War, which occurred around here, things always revert back to the trend line. No catastrophe, no matter how severe, has prevented this line from returning back to the trend line because the recovery is just as powerful as the shock event that knocked things off of the trend line temporarily. The Great Depression, World War II, no matter what, this trend line continues. And we are already entering a very steep part of the curve. It's getting steeper and steeper, as we can see. 2021 is all the way up here. 
you should be very happy that you were born in the era of the steep part of the curve because your ancestors lived over here, or even worse, the ancestors further back lived over here. And on that point, I'm going to go to another chart that extends this axis a bit further into the past. This is the exact same chart again. The vertical axis is completely unchanged, but the horizontal axis has been extended all the way back 2,500 years. So while the previous chart went back just about 600 years or so and ended over here, this one goes all the way back 2,500 years. And there's minimal data, but there's still a lot of indicators that enable one to project what the prosperity level of people was. And frankly, the prosperity level of people in 500 BC was no lower than it was in 1400 AD. There was extremely negligible progress in economic terms. There were inventions and things, of course, in that large window of time, but the diffusion of those inventions was very little. War and famines and other calamities kept economic growth stagnant, even though the exponential trend was building underneath, was building under the surface, and it's finally started to progress around 1500, but the economic growth rate was still very little per year, a fraction of a percent per year. By the 18th century, maybe a little bit higher. Only by the 19th century was 1% a year growth even the norm, and only by the second half of the 20th century was 3% a year the norm. And now that's getting faster and faster. And of course, as I have explained earlier, equity prices, not GDP, is the better metric and equity prices are rising exponentially. Now you can enter into something that has a return of 10% a year, like the S&P 500, very passively. You don't have to do any work. And because this is accelerating, I believe the future returns of even broad stock market indices will be much higher than 10% a year because this trend is continuing. But when you consider GDP going from 1% a year to 3% a year as a normal thing, the geometric increase should continue. The jump from 1 to 3 is no more remarkable than the jump from 3 to 9% a year, even if there's eventually a better metric than GDP in the future. This exponent has not stopped. There's a tremendous amount of proof that this gradient exists because if 3% a year of economic growth had started a long time ago, humanity would be orders of magnitude ahead, and that's obviously not the case. 3% a year involves doubling every 24 years. That means if 3% a year had started 480 years ago, that's 20 doublings. That is 1 million X. If 3% a year had started 2,400 years ago, like the beginning of the chart, that is 100 doublings. That is such a huge number they would be incomprehensible today. This exponential gradient has a huge number of evidence backing it up, and I'm happy to debate anyone on this topic, especially someone with a PhD in economics, because they have spent years training to be ignorant about something like this. But all of you should be extremely happy because you're in the steep part of the curve. And that is why we also see people go from having not much money to becoming billionaires in a short time, these tech entrepreneurs, the time it takes to become a billionaire via the path of tech entrepreneurship is getting shorter and shorter. A couple of decades ago, it still took 15 years or so. Then it shortened to seven or eight years. And now we see certain examples of it taking only two to three years in some cases because these processes are accelerating. The amount of net wealth being created is accelerating. This is evident also with the fact that the amount of quantitative easing done worldwide is also rising exponentially, and my entire Atom publication provides a lot of data about that that you can look at as well. Keep in mind that economic growth is exponential and accelerating. Extremely few people are even aware of this. As I said, only three people have written anything substantive about this in the last 15 years. So if you're even aware of this, you are so far ahead of the curve, no pun intended, that you are a very enlightened person. You've internalized a concept that has tangible real-world significance and are ahead of everyone who pretty much has a PhD in economics who has no understanding of any of this. Neither do people who are PhDs in history. They may be a historian with a credential who teaches at a university, but they don't understand things like this and how much this has affected the ebb and flow of historical events, which are another set of topics we will speak about on this channel. We are fortunate to be alive today. And if you're a younger person, say born after 1990 or even better, born after 2000, you have it even better than someone of my generation because you will be around in the second half of the 21st century. You may even be around for the technological singularity, which is also an economic singularity, which I estimate to happen around 2062, give or take, and I speak about in this card over here. Because by the middle of the century, the material abundance that exists by today's standards will be so high that 2050 will differ from 2021 by the same distance that 2021 differs from the 18th century. 
So it's really an astonishing time to be alive, and we are on the cusp of things going really fast and people becoming wealthy at a greater speed than has ever been possible before, just because of the trend line that this first principle of technology and economics has brought us to. So that is some considerable food for thought. But if you like this type of content, I encourage you to subscribe to this channel, and thank you for watching.